Hello, folks. Uh, thank you so much for joining uh, for my talk today. It's my very first HitBee. It's her very first HitBee as well. Uh, thank you so much to the organizers and to everybody for the opportunity to be here with you today. Um, so let's get started. For those of you who don't know me, my name is um, Juan Andres Guerrero Saade, or JAGS, if that's easier. Um, I like to think of myself as a cyber, cyber paleontologist or threat researcher. Um, I'm an adjunct lecturer at Johns Hopkins SICE, and I run epicterlaw.com, if some of you may have seen my research there before. So today we're going to be discussing um, advanced operations and sort of how we understand threat actors. Uh, particularly, I want to discuss how we as analysts can better understand some of the more complex fringe cases of how threat actors interact with one another and how we can do that at a code level, uh, what we can find when we look in that direction. So when I talk about advanced operations and, and sort of high-end threat actors and basically everything skirting around the idea of sort of sophisticated adversaries, um, what I'm referring to are the kind of operations and the kind of threat actors that rely already on levels of automation and abstraction and codified tradecraft that sort of places what they do at a different level altogether uh, than some of the you know, more run-of-the-mill adversaries or criminal adversaries that you might encounter. As observers, we have a kind of a complex relationship with time. So if you think about how an attack happens... Um, in the beginning, time favors the attacker. The defenders don't know that it's happening. Uh, when they do discover it, they might not have all the resources available in order to uh, to take full advantage and, and sort of investigate things. It's all sort of a race against time. Uh, so the attackers are heavily fa favored um, by time in the beginning. And I think this is this might be a distinction that I'm that I'm borrowing from the Grug to be to be fair. Um, however. Um, even though some things some things are hard for us to understand and first encounter with a new operation, uh, we have to remember that uh, time essentially skews in our favor as it progresses. After the operation, after the initial rundown, the running with your hair on fire, um, it turns out that uh, the attackers can't retroactively go and remove um, indications of their attacks, things that you may have collected. So uh, if you take the time, we can essentially say that the Time will favor the defenders, the observers, the adversaries um, as it progresses. Now, we should be taking full advantage of that dynamic in order to better understand these threat actors, in order to better understand what is a really complex threat landscape. Um, and that's sort of my, uh, that's my argument for something that I like to refer to as, as malware paleontology or cyber paleontology, which is just a fancy way of saying, you know, Rather than chasing every ambulance and, and only looking at the newest, hottest, coolest threat actors, um, let's take the time to go back. Let's look backwards. Let's understand uh, what it is that we have seen and whether we got things right, whether we missed something. Uh, there's a lot for us to to still understand about some of these seminal you know attacks that have happened uh, long, long ago. And, you know, my friends will make fun of me and they say that and I'm sort of trying to Indiana Jones my way through my career. And in a way, perhaps I am, but I think that there's a lot of interesting stuff to be found. So when we look back at these older operations, it's actually amazing how much context and insight we can add. It's to say that not necessarily that we miss things, but we don't have the added benefit of you know, new insights, new technologies, new techniques, other operations, uh, other insights from other, you know, researchers and other people in the community, a lot happens uh, that we need to take stock of. So some examples of this sort of work uh, that we've done in the past include things like our, our research into Moonlight Maze, uh, where, you know, we looked at an operation that was, you know, more than 20 years old and actually found how uh, on a technical level, it mapped onto the operations of a, of a current threat actor, of someone that's been around uh, for the past uh, 20 years, uh, the namesake of my blog. Um, similarly, we did work into Gossip Girl, and you can see me, you know, looking quite silly over here. Uh, but you can see some of the, uh, the different threat actors that we saw sort of collaborating into what 
resulted in the Stuxnet attack, which, of course, I expect most of you to know about. Um, if any of you are interested, the details are all available on my blog, and you can understand why, what it is that I'm referring to with these different projects, both of which are really sizable and, you know, it would take a lot more time than, than we have available to cover right now. So something that we start to touch upon with work like Gossip Girl is expanding the scope of the kind of research that we want to do, not just uh, to look at more things, to look at older things, but rather to look at more than a single threat actor at a given moment. Most threat intel products focus on a single campaign or a single threat actor. And to be entirely fair, that's more than enough work all on its own. Uh, you know, not criticizing anybody in the industry for what they do. I think that, you know, I've done this kind of work before. It, it is quite complex. It takes a lot of time. Um, and my argument is that today I'd really like to take this a step further and sort of start to emphasize a different approach uh, that we can take in hindsight, that we can apply to things that have already been found, things that have already been discovered, um, and, and do what I'm going to refer to as a sort of a threat actor genealogy. We want to understand how some of these different families and some of these different groups actually uh, coordinate. Because when we focus on a single threat actor, what that entails is a very large gap in our understanding. And, and even in the sort of general epistemology of how we understand the cyber domain, uh, which is to say, what does it look like when multiple threat actors cooperate towards a common goal? Um, it, it goes to show that as an industry so far, as we sort of discover these concepts and we sort of come to understand some of these new things, um, we know very little about how threat actors coordinate how they do joint organization, and how they do cooperation. And of course, you're going to have that with intelligence um, sharing alliances with different sort of diplomatic organizations uh, and different coordination between uh, allied countries. Of course, you're going to have different types of cooperation. So I mentioned Gossip Girl before. Gossip Girl was sort of this umbrella entity um, for multiple threat actors that were cooperating together in order to, you know, create what resulted in the Stuxnet attack. Um, that is something that for us, for Silas Cutler and I, who, who worked on this together, uh, it really emphasized a, a gap in our concepts as far as sort of threat intel practitioners went. You know, if we look at, um, if we look at sort of how you would normally organize some of this research, you've got malware families, you have infrastructure and targets, you might have a series of campaigns or a single campaign that you're looking at, and then that all falls under the umbrella of a, um, of a threat actor, right? So how do we categorize something like Gossip Girl? And, you know, this has been subject to some criticism. Some folks don't like the idea of adding another concept, another fancy term of art. But if you add, you know, other threat actors to the picture and you want to say, you know, how is it that these folks are sort of coordinating, cooperating? And, and what does that look like to us where we don't have a granular understanding of what that ultimately um, will look like? We decided to sort of bring about this term that I've really been, you know, sort of pushing for this very specific kind of situation, which is a super threat actor or an STA. And the idea is not just to do some marketing, but rather to say this is a cooperative framework between multiple threat actors. And I think that it's an important distinction for us to have. So if we're going to suggest that this is a thing that happens and this is something that is worth adopting... Gossip Girl is a great example, but where are the other super threat actors? Is there such a thing as a Maximator, as another uh, intelligence sharing alliance out there that we have encountered during our research uh, and that we just have not recognized as such? Um, as observers, would we even be able to recognize a super threat actor when we see them? Keep in mind, I mean, a lot of the stuff that we know about Stuxnet in part had to do with the kind of technical research that folks did, but it also had to do with leaks and, and things that, that folks discussed and maybe they shouldn't have. So it is uh, not an illegitimate question to ask whether we can, in fact, recognize one of these um, when we see them just on a technical level in the wild. Uh, and it's quite possible that we have miscategorized uh, such encounters in the past. 
So I think that there's one really obvious candidate for a super threat actor, uh, and that's Regan. Uh, for those of you that don't know Regan, I mean, do yourself a favor. Go check out the reports of Symantec and Kaspersky did an amazing amount of work uh, on Regan back in 2014, 2015. Um, Regan is sort of this fascinating multi-year, multi-modular, multi-platform um, threat actor with just a fantastic range and probably some of the best orchestrated, uh, automated and so on um, operations. And you should absolutely take some time to look at it. I wish that I could really cover Reagan properly. Uh, but, you know, we're trying to have kind of a, a slightly just not more high level conversation about them. So I'm just kind of going to gloss over, but please check those reports out if you're interested. So why would we consider that a candidate for an STA for a super threat actor? Well, for one, because we know that it is a semi-coordinated umbrella entity for different organizations. And in this particular case, it's one uh, for four distinct organizations. So how do we know this? Well, we know this from, from two ways. One of them is leaked documents, which, I mean, that's one way to look at things. The other one is actually from different PDB paths and embedded crypto names and code names that were, you know, left behind in some of the samples, which is quite interesting. I mean, you can see references to DSD and code names from uh, GCHQ and whatnot that, that are all sort of baked together into some of these samples. And then, of course, the leaked documents kind of confirmed what, what some of us had, had suspected. And this is where, you know, I introduce another figure into this talk, which is our interlocutor with somebody who's going to come in and say, hey, hey, the only reason that you know that is because of leaked documents. And that's cheating. And to be completely fair, our annoying interlocutor is right. It is correct. We should be able to prove these things, these connections on a technical level. Otherwise, we're not doing our work right. Sorry. Um, moreover, while Regan fits the bill for a super threat actor, just from what we know, there's actually a massive elephant in the room for anybody that's following along at home and, and kind of understands uh, the background about these organizations that we're discussing. Um, there's a fifth organization that's missing from what we, we could refer to as this malware Voltron, this sort of thing that uh, this sort of superpower captain planet organization of, of uh, multiple badasses, right? And there's sort of like this fifth really key organization that that should be a part of this, but isn't as far as we can tell. So the question that we should be asking is, well, where is the equation group, right? If we're sort of compiling this Five Eyes Voltron, um, we're clearly missing the head. For anybody who doesn't know the equation group or you know, has been living under a rock, essentially, um, Definitely check out 2015 uh, discovery by uh, my colleagues over at, at Great, Kaspersky's Global Research and Analysis team. Um, you might also want to check out some of the stuff that happened with the shadow brokers. So a lot more leaks. And you can imagine our interlocutors can have some things to say about that, right? But um, in any case, Regan and Equation Group traditionally operate as two massive standalone platforms. So we're kind of missing... Um, that tidbit of connection for the argument that we're trying to advance at this point. However, they do exhibit shared development traits. Um, there's a shared API library that connects uh, the Regan and Equation frameworks. Uh, this is something that Kosin Ryu discussed in one of his talks. Um, there's been some some interesting research uh, to that effect by by Facundo lately. Um, so the code similarity analysis shows that CNLI-1.dll, also known as the, the, the CNE lib, um, or possibly as the Wasowski API, is used by both Regan and Equation in order to abstract interactions with their host OS. Uh, if you think about this uh, on a level of abstraction, which is what we, you know, we said we were looking out for for really advanced operations, if you're writing all this code, um, you really want to abstract how uh, it interacts with the operating system so that you could basically just drop in a different library uh, and make that same malware compatible with an entirely different platform. Uh, so it, it is actually quite brilliant, quite well done. It's what we would expect of um, this level of operations. And in this particular case, if you focus on CNLI-1.dll, 
Uh, the 32-bit version and the 64-bit versions consistently connect these different operations from both uh, Regan and Equation Group. And this is where our interlocutor comes back and rightly complains that this is based on leaked files. It's based on something that, you know, we got that perfectly baked uh, library from some of the Shadow Brokers releases. So that's also cheating. Once again, our interlocutor, as annoying as he is, is completely right. And that, you know, we're not doing our work right if, if we're just relying on these leaked documents to figure that out. So moreover... If we're going to make the argument that this is an STA, that this is a super threat actor, fine, we see shared development traits, but we haven't witnessed a joint operation that bridges the two frameworks. So we can't exactly say that we have seen the, you know, Five Eyes Voltron come together to, to, to take on some, some great task. So it makes you wonder if we're actually missing something. Looking back on Regan... Samples of Regan basically weaned off of our radars around 2012. Anywhere from 2011 to 2013, you start to see things just kind of drop off, right? I have to admit, that's, you know, not taking into account some very notorious smoke signals, which is, if you believe some of the reporting, it's, there's a suggestion that, that Regan, a new version of Regan, a Regan 2.0, was discovered at Yandex um, not long ago. Uh, no details have been released. No samples have been shared. I hope the folks over at Yandex, if it's true, that, that they'll be kind enough to, to share some of this with us so that we can better understand this. Uh, but in any case, you know, we don't have something quite so fancy as Regan 2.0 to play with and try to understand. Um, but how about a Regan 1.5? So this is where I introduce something that I, um, codenamed 0x fancy filter or 0xff for short when we first started researching it. Um, a good friend of mine pointed me in the direction of, of an unusual sample. It's a DAT file that appears out of thin air. And when I say it appears out of thin air, I'm not trying to be opaque. I'm actually referring to the fact that chances are that this file is, is being dropped with some, some very fancy quantum um, insert style techniques, but in any case, for anybody doing incident response, it, it just sort of appears um, out of nowhere. And you can see some of the details here. Um, I'll be sure to provide some of this information uh, in a consumable fashion in the very near future. Now, what makes 0xFF so interesting? Um, for one, it, it it's a Regan sample. It shares a lot of code with the general Regan framework. Uh, it also shares code with some very um, unusual, very rare Regan components like Hopscotch. Um, it shares unique code with Hopscotch, which was a, a lateral movement tool that was discovered uh, sometime after the original Regan. And you can see uh, there's a blog from um, the great team on Hopscotch and Legspin that you should check out. And even with this particularly rare sample, we see, you know, sort of this uh, non-trivial overlap between the two. But 0xFF isn't a lateral movement tool. It's actually a special validator for complex environments. And um, what we mean by a validator is actually a first stage tool that's meant to, you know, you infect your victim with this first stage and you verify who the victim is, whether you're in the right computer before pulling uh, your next stage and your more specialized tools, right? Now, what makes it special and the reason that it's used in complex environments is it's actually meant to piggyback off of Internet Explorer. Uh, it takes advantage of all of the connection settings of Internet Explorer. So whenever Internet Explorer is loaded, um, it is able to reach out, uh, connect, and, and do some of these other uh, bits of, of validator functionality. Uh, it's registered as a MIME filter, and it actually does some some very interesting things with uh, parsing out, you know, image source tags and uh, looking for a special knock. Um, now, more interestingly, a, the newer sample of Fancy Filter actually encrypts um, most of its configuration data in a resource that's encrypted with RC4. Um, and if you, you know, decrypt that and start looking with some of the contents in there, you actually find about three or four slightly older samples of, of 0xFF, but it's still pretty rare malware uh, from what I've been able to find so far. The older samples are called httpfilt.dll or htmlfilt.dll. It's this sort of theme of filtering. Uh, but be careful, be aware. Um, htmlfilt was also a file name for an old security product. Uh, quite interestingly, 
It's a security product that was tracked in the territorial dispute driver list. So make of that what you will. Uh, but yeah, don't get, don't get too hung up on that. And our interlocutor chimes in and says, fine, fine. You know, you found a new Oregon. So what? Well, I'll tell you. The reason that we're looking at this is that these samples don't just correlate with Regan components. Zero X Fancy Filter actually shares significant code with something called NetHandler. And NetHandler is another component that's also tracked in the driver list. And interestingly, the driver list gives us an NSA cryptonym for what NetHandler is. It's something called Misty Veal. Um, Misty Veal is actually a massive lead because, uh, share, you know, leaked documents actually have a description of what this piece of malware is supposed to be doing. And, well, here I have to give a fair warning. This is a classification warning. Uh, if you have a clearance uh, and you really don't want to get in trouble and you don't want to have to fill out a bunch of paperwork, please avert your eyes now. I'll let you know when you can open them again. But if you look at this description from one of the Snowden docs, you can actually uh, see that uh, Misty Veal is a type of validator. It is supposed to function as a browser helper object. Um, and it's supposed to piggyback on IE. It's basically all the things that we said that it was um, when we were describing Fancy Filter. But in this case, we're describing an equation group um, piece of malware that's much, much older. So, okay, you can look back. Uh, we have averted this classification crisis. So this old school Misty Veal validator was actually included in the original great discovery of, of equation group double fantasy. Uh, it is significantly older than fancy filter. Um, and what's interesting is the original Misty Veal does not share code with Regan. Additionally, uh, there are actually small unique connections uh, between uh, 0x Fancy Filter and other parts of the Equation Group Toolkit. There's a uh, shared code uh, with something called Teflon Door and Teflon Handle, which are meant to be sort of firewall tools. Um, there's uh, some connection with ArchyTouch, which is a recon tool, uh, and even some, you know, very small code overlaps with uh, equation group exploits like Eternal Synergy. Uh, and the point is that it's these connections are not there because of shared functionality. They're there because of a shared developmental framework, which is precisely uh, what we would have expected to see with operations of that, um, of, you know, the ilk and the level of the equation group. So our interlocutor says, you know, what's your point, right? My point is that looking back, uh, in order to understand the nuances of our threat actors, in order to understand the nuances of this sort of complex landscape, is really the only way that we're going to understand these really complex, uh, multi-year uh, organizations that have a lot of institutional history that are trying to essentially sort of idiot-proof their ops so that they can um, they can work for for any kind of operator for any kind of uh, of person sort of running these ops and we really shouldn't miss the opportunity to look back and see what we find I mean uh, Reagan was something that was researched extensively people you know spent a lot of time on it they did a lot of amazing work uh, and yet they didn't have the context of the equation group release. Uh, then when the equation group release happened, they didn't have the context of the shadow brokers leak. They didn't have the context, um, of some of the code similarity technology that was developed later and that we've come to use and figure out how to take advantage of, um, for a lot of this research. So where does that put us to essentially put a bow on what we've been looking at? We're trying to figure out how this cooperative umbrella of threat actors is really working. And what we've figured out is if you're looking at Regan, which is meant to share um, or sort of be the shared platform for the operations of these four organizations, we've got, you know, Regan and all of its multiple payloads and stages, uh, this Regan developmental framework, and then uh, some of these rare pieces like Hopscotch. Um, on the other hand, we've got the equation group with its own set of developmental frameworks. In this particular case, we're focusing on the double fantasy one, uh, which results in things like Misty Veal. Um, and then 
You know, at first we had this early understanding of their shared development based on the Wasowski API, the CNE library. Uh, but more importantly, now we see what may be a shared operation, what may be a shared retooling, but in any case, a collaboration between those two developmental frameworks into Regin 1.5 or what we might refer to as 0x fancy filter. So I hope that this sort of visually illustrates how these things come together, what we can put together when we do some of this retrospective research, and hopefully the beginnings of, uh, you know, more of a curiosity about what we can figure out about these ops. I mean, these are eight, 10 year old ops. They're, you know, long gone malware. It's not like you're interfering with anybody's important operations, but it is actually a really crucial thing for us as threat intel researchers and observers to better understand this really complex threat landscape. So with zero X fancy filter, it's basically the missing link that places uh, the equation group at the head of this five eyes malware Voltron to follow a friend's suggestion. Um, so I hope that that sort of entices what's the appetite to start looking back a little bit more. Uh, I refer you to my website, epicturla.com, because I'm going to be releasing uh, some YAR rules and, you know, more of a breakdown, IOCs, and maybe even my IDB if I'm, you know, comfortable letting you see how bad of a reverser I actually am. Uh, and I hope that some of you will get involved and, and reach out. So thank you so much for attending my talk, and I hope you found it interesting.